this, there we go. Hi. Um, so let's, like, if you're in the back, and we're going to call on you. This was Suzette's idea. <laughs> called on. If you're sitting in the front, you're not. So as long as you want to get called on, feel free to sit in the back. In the last room, somebody in the front literally got fought with a sword. I know. Did anybody see that? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so my name is Dale Thomas Vaughn, and I uh, have been given the incredible opportunity to lead this panel on gender equality in large organizations. I'm excited about it because there's uh, a lot of uh, breadth and depth of experience and of information that is ac applicable. Um, so we're going to get into some things that I think is going to be really useful. How, just by show of hands, how many of you are currently in a large company, large organization of some kind? OK, so this is our audience. Great. Very cool. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Let's see if this thing's working. Here we go. So let's just start. Um, I put them up in alphabetical order by first name, it's trying to be uh, gender equal. So there we go. But let's start here, Suzette. Would you mind introducing yourself and where you're from, your company, and um, we'll just kind of start there. Yeah. OK, good afternoon. Thanks for uh, having us here. I work for Walgreens. I am responsible for all of the pharmacy systems that take care of 3 million prescription fills a day across 8,500 stores. So that's what I do. And how has, uh, let's start kind of like your experience with gender equality in your large organization to start. Yeah, so uh, Walgreens has about 250,000 employees uh, at our corporate or support office, as we call it. We have about 10,000, and uh, we have had some success uh, on the gender equality side. We are, I'm very proud to say, we have three women on our corporate board, which uh, we were a little bit of trailblazers, including uh, women on our corporate board, but they have been instrumental in really pushing the gender equality agenda at Walgreens, and, and from there, we've, we've done quite a few things that we'll talk about today. Nadia? Thank you. Normally when I'm past a mic on stage, I start singing, but I will not do that today. <laughs> no, really. Um, not very good. Uh, my name is Nadia Chargoloff, and I work for Telstra. Who here has heard of Telstra before? Few people, not very many. Uh, Telstra has its roots in Australia. We are a telecommunications and technology company. We are a $28 billion AUD company. Um, we have 33,000 employees worldwide, 3,300 of which are outside of Australia. I obviously sit in the international side of the business. I run human resources for the US. Um, <clears throat> and in that regard, uh, Diversity and gender diversity in particular has been very front of mind with our recruitment efforts and all of our programs over the, the past few years, certainly since I've been with the organization. I think this is on. I'm Amy Logan. I'm president of the U.S. National Committee for UN Women, San Francisco Bay Area. Do you all know what UN Women is? No, it's the UN, yes, Dale knows. It's the UN agency tasked with advancing women's human rights, female empowerment, and gender equality in the world. And um, I'm head of the San Francisco Bay Area's nonprofit that raises funds and awareness for UN women. And I am in the process of launching Gender Innovation, my consulting and training firm that will help companies integrate gender equality into their business cultures and systems. I'm Benita Banducci, and I have been doing consulting under my own company, Banducci Consulting, uh, in this field of what I call gender competence uh, since, well, the early uh, 1990s. And I have been teaching at Santa Clara University. I'm a lecturer in the graduate engineering program. Uh, my class is called Gender and Engineering, and I I'm just really proud of the culture of, of Santa Clara University, uh, which prides itself in developing leaders of competence, conscience, and compassion. And the dean of the engineering school in 2000 said that he wanted to have a gender communication class 
and I was recommended to, uh, to him to teach the class, and I've been teaching it. It was originally an elective, and now it's part of the core curriculum, um, the core curriculum for engineering and society. So more to be said. And I'm Dale Thomas Vaughn, and I started the Gender Leadership Group with a few partners, and we do consulting work on specifically how to engage men in the process of gender equality within corporations. Um, and we have a conference as well called the Better Man Conference in San Francisco, and that's top, that topic is largely about engaging men in general in, the, in, in an inclusionary leadership context. Um, I've been doing this kind of work and ending sexism in all of its forms since I was in my teens, uh, starting in domestic violence and sexual assault prevention and then moving into um, where I think the, the issue kind of is front and center for the, major, the majority of us these days is at the workplace. So um, that's been my experience. And I'm excited about today because we're gonna start with uh, an image that is um, from McKinsey and it's something that I think really tells the story of the whole conference today and, um, and just kind of starting with the reality of gender equality in the corporate pipeline. Um, so I wanna start with this question of is representation specifically, just gender representation, is that step one of this whole movement? And if it's not, what is? <laughs> Anybody want to take it on? Well, I, I certainly think that uh, the presence of, of women is important, uh, naturally. Um, I think what might be, um, I guess in my mind, sort of the linchpin issue is, is really um, the redistribution of unpaid care and work. Um, so what I mean by that is the shopping, the cooking, the cleaning, the child care, the caring for the, the sick and the elderly, which all over the world disproportionately falls on the shoulders of women. And so um, their partners need to step up and share that uh, burden so that women can advance in the workplace. And a lot of times when the partners are, are asked, you know, why, they, they don't. The reasons they give, um, partly that is um, attributed to the fact that they, they will be stigmatized or penalized at work. Um, so I feel like employers really need to actually step up and create uh, corporate cultures that are family friendly so that not only um, will women advance in the workplace, and to become whole people, um, but men will have deeper relationships with their family members and become whole people too. So um, that's, that's kind of my thinking. Um, you know, having women present is one thing, but having a corporate culture that is welcoming and embraces um, whole people with all of their lives is critical in my mind. I'd like to take, I absolutely agree, and I'd like to take the other side of the, the other dimension to this, which is that it's not just about putting, putting women in and stirring. It's not just about the numbers. Um, we were talking earlier about even one woman on a board doesn't, that makes a difference. But it doesn't, it's not a critical mass. There's been research that shows that you need to have a critical mass of, for instance, three women on the board. 20%, I think, is usually the percentage uh, to have a, a culture of uh, different perspective at a decision-making table, although one will make a difference. And um, my own work has to do with not just communication, but really understanding the different competencies that women often bring, or what I will call more relational people, because there are also um, men who are more relational, wh whether it's the cultural influence or other influences. Uh, but this whole set of relational competencies that some of you have been in my sessions and known about, I'm not gonna go into it now, but this, I think the main point is you just, it's become pretty well recognize that you don't just add women and stir. I think, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what I would add is I, I agree 
that having the presence of women is important, and I do think it needs to be a critical mass. There is research that shows, um, you, you know, you hear, well, sometimes women are really supportive of other women, and sometimes women are really nasty to other women. And in research, what they found is the highest uh, contributor to how women will act is how many women are in senior leadership. So if there's a lot of women in senior leadership, women tend to cooperate more, collaborate more, because they see like, oh, well, you can make it, and I can make it, and you can, like, we can all make it. And if there's not very many women, then it, the scarcity principle starts to play in, and it's going to be either you or me, and I want it to be me, so it can't be you, right? And so that's been the largest factor that they've found is really more cultural than anything to do with the individual personalities or that they want to help or don't want to help. Um, so I think, Benita, to your point, right, it, it does require critical mass. And so that is the starting point, but how do we get there, right? I think in order to get there, there needs to be a lot more understanding of what the challenge is. So one of the things that when I go in and do the work I do inside corporations is I recognize um, there's this thought process I hear a lot from especially men in the groups I work with. Well, it seems like we have a woman on our board. Like we're pretty, we're doing really well. Like we've, I, I seem to work around women, so we must be doing okay with this gender equality thing. And I show this slide in the beginning and I often get a lot of stares like, that can't be us, that can't be us. That's not our company. And I have run across very seldom a company that this is not the same image as their pipeline. So just presenting numbers sometimes I think can be very persuasive. But I think that also the experience of this starts to break down. Like I, I actually am fortunate in that when I came up, my mentors were actually women in the workplace. They were all women of the senior vice president or higher level. Um, that's, I found out later, not common. And the experience of those people who I respect, um, that I care about their experiences. So suddenly seeing this and recognizing that the people who mentored me were fighting and fighting and fighting in what I thought was a meritocracy was actually um, actively trying to keep them from being at the top level. Um, so when I see this and when I present this, I think one of the biggest things, it's like the shock factor for some, for men specifically. But I heard something the other, um, in another session yesterday, I, a woman said, I felt the glass ceiling hit me. Has that been your experience? Have you felt the glass ceiling? I'll respond to that, not because I've felt the glass ceiling. But when I did my original research at Sun Microsystems in the early 90s, what was just amazing to me, uh, it's changed since then, but it was very clear that director level was the level that you were promoted to where you become a spokesperson for the company. And that's where the glass ceiling was. It was just like so clear that you just couldn't become a spokesperson for the company. Now, again, we've, that's changed. There are people that are at a much, it's a higher level now. But still, it's uh, that um, sense of uh, something so clearly uh, delineating someone being promoted to that level. I would say uh, a lot of my middle career I spent in smaller organizations. And so I didn't feel it as much because I think in smaller organizations, uh, just the likelihood that everyone knows you and they know how good the work is that you do, uh, I was able to progress uh, pretty easily. I, I would say when you get into larger organizations, I think the glass ceiling appears much thicker, we'll say, much thicker glass. Uh, and I, I definitely have felt it, right? And it, it comes in the form of, uh, well, you need better executive presence. Or, you know, I think you're kind of harsh. You know, people say you're kind of harsh. Um, I'm like, really? Because I have the best engagement scores out of anyone in the company. So I'm pretty sure people like working in my organization. <laughs> Right? And so it's not about the data, it's about uh, more the soft, 
softer areas, right? Not my accomplishments, not, you know. It's like literally invisible. Right. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, so, one of the other things that in my work we end up doing is presenting numbers that persuade people that this is a big deal. Why, why are we even talking, why is the glass ceiling something that we should be talking about aside from the women getting into leadership? Well, let's talk about the, just the business context of this. A lot of these numbers have been put out. This is my favorite study. It's a UC Davis study of 400 public companies. The 34 firms with the highest gender diversity among executives and board members earn 300% more revenue and 50% higher profit than the average company. These are not small numbers, and I'm wondering why aren't executives in large companies just running through whatever wall they have to to make gender diversity a top priority? I think that for many large corporations, especially those here in Silicon Valley, I think that it's definitely on the agenda. Why hasn't there been a whole lot of traction? Well, I think a couple things, and I think you might have touched on it earlier, is that many, when you show that first slide um, with the pipeline and, and the numbers dwindling as they go up, that's usually a shocking slide to both men and women in organizations. I think that they look at it in the perspective of, I'm not biased, I work with women, I have women customers, or I have men customers, and I work with men, and we all get along, and this isn't applicable here, right? Um, we did a gender workshop uh, just last week, actually, in my company, and that was exactly the sentiment. So it, it's that having that unconscious bias and not being aware of the barriers to true gender partnership in the workplace. I think it is something when you put the business case out there, business people will say, well, yeah, let's do this, let's solve this problem. But it's first having that discussion and opening that discussion up within teams to first understand what the statistics are within their organizations, within their teams, and then obviously the real reason from hitting the bottom line of why we need to solve for it, and then figuring out ways to work together to actually solve for it. Yeah. I think I would add to that, that I agree with all of those things. I think um, I would add to that, it's not something that's gonna turn around overnight. And so I do think, especially in large organizations, because of the business case, there is a lot of talk about it. But because they don't, because we don't in general, men and women understand unconscious bias and the structures that really inhibit women, um, it, it's hard to make progress. And the progress will be slow in the sense that that pipeline, right, it, it isn't there. And until we start at the bottom, right, and go, okay, we have to have 50-50 into managers, and then we have to have 50-50 into directors, and then like, you can't just go, okay, let's put 50-50 on the SVPs. Where are you gonna find 50% women SVPs? Like, where you get them from doesn't have 50%, right? And so all companies can't, can't do that, right? Someone might be able to get more than their fair share, right? And we do see that, obviously, in companies that are very proactive and, and really great places for women to work. They'll get their more, more than their fair share. Uh, but we really have to be working on that whole pipeline. And I would say all the way back to girls, right? Especially um, from a STEM or technology perspective, there's an extremely scary statistic that since 1987, uh, every um, like section, right? So uh, elementary school, then middle school, then high school, then going into college and then coming out of college and actually being in a STEM career has gone down since 1987. Right, so 1987 was like this peak. So we were kind of like working on it, working on it, it was going great, and then something happened. And all this happened since then has gone downhill. Right, so we have to, that pipeline problem, right, starts way, way early. And um, Ms. Broderick was talking about it, you know, this morning in uh, her keynote, and I think 
one of the things that we all can do, right, is help participate in organizations that help girls um, to, to want to be in STEM, to, to want to achieve, right? I, I think, on a personal note, um, my mom, I was one of four girls, I was the youngest, and I'm pretty sure my dad just pretended I was a boy because he didn't have any boys, so I learned to do all kinds of mechanical things. Um, I could fix just about anything. Um, but my mom really instilled in us that, you know, you have to be able to support yourself. And so I was really lucky. Like, I, I grew up thinking, okay, yeah, I can, I, I was the breadwinner. My husband stayed home with the kids, right? Like, that seemed perfectly normal to me, <laughs> right? I mean, my, my mom always, you know, instilled that value in me. And I think that's very unusual, right? And so we have to, as a society, start instilling that value in girls and, um, Yeah, that's fair. My husband is one of five children, and he has four sisters. And also a very strong mother, actually. So yes, yeah, very good, good point. And um, back to Amy, right, like the society has to change and say, you know, women, men should be, can be, want to be. Um, I'm pretty sure every dad wants to see every soccer game just as much as every mom wants to see every soccer game. Right? And the thing is, our society says it's okay for the dads not to see it, but it's not okay for the moms not to see it. Right? And so, sorry, I'm on. No, it's good. I think you make a great point, which is that if we're talking about gender equality, then we have to equally talk about genders. And part of that is that boys and men have gender as well. Instead of seeing them as gender blank, seeing ourselves as gender blank, we can start to see ourselves as, oh, gender affects me positively and negatively in different ways. And if I don't understand that, if I'm not aware of that, then I'm not being a good father, I'm not being a good partner, I'm not being a good son, I'm not, all those things. So gender, and this is one of the things that I think comes up when we start talking about the business case of this. There's this idea in the corporate world that male gender is right gender and every other gender is other gender. And I think the part of the conversation here has to be about the effect of, and this is, goes to your work, Benita, the, the effect of like, I'm not a person at work, I'm a person that's coded a certain way. And, uh, and I mean coded by the culture. And so part of this is, you know, breaking the, the idea that we have to have somebody who fits a specific mold rather than let's open up to creative diversity within our boardroom, within, ev within every level. And we, this is why the, the statistics bear out. The, the creative diversity, the creative thought diversity, um, and understanding the differences in the gender. And this is some, so Benina, can we talk about your piece sure. here? This is actually a, a great time to talk about this. This is, someone recently asked me, what's your favorite slide? So I said, this is my favorite slide. This is actually a cross-cultural difference slide that applies absolutely to gender, and that's why I like it, because it, it's both culture and gender, in terms of looking at the different, the low-context way of seeing the world and the high-context way of seeing the world. This picture is about a conversation, seeing conversation, but that could be the globe, you know, the, the uh, world there in the center, the globe. It's the way you see the world, and uh, not just the way you see it, but also the way you think and the way you speak. So, and this is what we could call uh, diversity of thought, but it's also the diversity of what I call competencies, uh, because how it's, it plays out in, in work. So, we have the low context people. What do you think the low context people think of the high context people? What do you think the high context people think of the low, the low context people? It's like, where are they coming from, right? The low context people are thinking, ah, oh, they're scattered and all over the place. And I've literally had a senior executive say, women are not ready yet because they're not, they're not competent. And I'd say, well, what does competency look like? And he said, well, they'd be able to get right to the heart of the matter. Women keep bringing in all this peripheral stuff, whereas we're proud I mean, often, and I say we as a relational person, I want to switch from just saying women. Um, 
we are proud of connecting the dots and what I've called uh, fire prevention. Because I had a great interview with Carol Bartz when she was head of Sun Microsystems, I mean second in command at Sun Microsystems. And she identified herself as being able to see all the different ramifications of a given issue and be able to prevent fires. That's what she brought to the executive team. Whereas they were more the fire preventers, where they take the highest priority problem and put it put the highest priority solution against it and fight those fires. That's much more linear and uh, prioritized against a more systems way of thinking. Both are valuable, don't get me wrong. Both are valuable, but when they don't understand each other and when the relational people don't understand that they're misunderstood. Carol Bartz actually told me that she was considered to be a not, not a team player because she was stalling the action. You know, she comes up with this complex solution. We can't just get to it. I want to get to it, get in action. Um, and she was getting to other people's turfs. So, you know, that was my big aha, that not only was her competency invisible and unarticulated, but it was also being misinterpreted as being incompetent, you know, not being a team player. So again, I. I, some of you have been in my sessions, you know I can go on and on about this, but that's fundamentally what I see is an important missing piece is the perception of competency. And uh, I'll just add one more thing. There is research that's showing that um, often women are appraised or even given evaluations or letters of recommendation with commu what's called communal language, which is that, that's like relational you know, how well, we, how well we work with people and we can be trusted and, and this and that. Really, you can be very positive, but not talking in what's called agentic language, which is action language, what you do and the results you produce. So it even goes to how people appraise um, and uh, make, again, letters of recommendation. You can see it in that. Um, so that would tend to hold people back from being seen as being the most competent and uh, the most promotable. One of the things I love about this topic and the way you've just laid that out is you see the opportunity for partnership in that. I, I think we've been seeing like, you're either this or you're that. Well, what if you're this and I'm that and we come together? And that's the possibility, I think. Well, and you're right. And the thing is that that's one of the distinctions I have is that the more individualistic way of looking at things is it's either or, whereas a more relational way of looking at things is it's both and. And how can we have it be both and? But especially if you're only thinking through either or. And that's where the teaching element comes in. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, you know, being able to what I call adapt and adopt be able to teach the people that you work right. with how you're competent, and we, uh, also be able to speak in their language, to be able to translate what you have to say into their language. We, we just did a workshop. I'm looking at Nadia because we were doing a workshop together, basically. And um, the, uh, we talked a little bit about the difference between gender equality, equity, and partnership, right? How many of you are clear about gender equality versus gender partnership? So essentially, gender equality is the basic sort of access that we hope everyone has, right? Gender partnership is the idea that we actually identify each other's differences and work with each other to make something better than simply sort of the equality piece. Equality step one, but partnerships is the, the goal. And when I brought this up in a room, a mixed room, uh, there was one gentleman who was like, I've never heard that before and that sounds awesome. Like, I'm so excited about this idea. It was really cool to see um, that this was immediately applicable to somebody who is in the low context individualistic mode, who's like, you know, the reality is maybe that's a blinder I put on at work, and it, in the rest of my life, I'm very high context. I'm super relational, and I would like to bring that to work. I'd like to be a whole person, to your point, Amy. Um, so taking the opportunity to kind of take the blinders off even at work. Like these are modes we think in rather than allowing space for both to exist. Just a thought. Um, I wanna move to one of the things that's holding us back. So this is a manpower group study that the most significant obstacle to gender diversity, gender equality is an entrenched male culture, a barrier that even men acknowledged must change. 
Um, Manpower Group is not specifically about men, by the way. That's an HR company. Um, <laughs> it is an interesting. I just realized how funny that looks now. Um, but I want to talk about this male culture, and we've sort of recoded it as individualistic culture, individualistic thinking. But how has male culture influenced you and your culture? Have you, or in your company, have you experienced male culture positively, negatively? Um, are there ways that you see male culture as kind of something you have to conform to rather than um, something you'd like to shift? Give me some kind of aspect of this barrier that you've come across. Um, <clears throat> so, I think we've had a number of discussions actually in my organization about some of the things that are particularly male cult culture. Um, one of the things, it's, we're a sales organization basically in the U.S., right? Selling services to Asia Pac, to companies who have a need for network capability in the Asia Pac region, right? So, primarily sales. A lot of sales events, a lot of sales conferences. Um, some of our sales women are here today at the conference and also very uh, impressed that this is the first women's conference that they've been to um, for work and also benef or not benefiting anymore from the line in the ladies' bathroom. But uh, one of the things that came up is a lot of times there's golf events on top of these conferences. Um, one that happened uh, down in Vegas and it, there was also a uh, Infinity Group through our channel partners. So at the same time that they had a golf outing, they had a ladies' tee for all the women or saleswomen in channel partnership, right? So we thought, well, I am an avid golfer. And I, when I found this out, I said, that's not right. We need to change this. And I noticed <clears throat> there weren't a lot of women golfers on our sales force, but none of them had ever been asked to go out to golf. All of them had had a desire to golf, so I'm proud to actually represent to this group that we are now gonna have our first um, brilliantly connected women's golf outing next Friday. And that was a direct result of having discussions about gender partnership and changing that idea of what is really a male culture. So were these women barred from spending four to five hours out on a nice, beautiful day talking to their customer? Absolutely, was that actually possibly hurting their pocketbook or their commission? Absolutely. So it's not only um, identifying, identifying what is male culture, it's also changing what the business culture is, right? So my argument for golf is, because I love it, is there's not very many venues where you can go out and spend a whole day with a customer. And if you, even if you don't like golfing, you're, it's five hours that you have, four to five hours that you have just speaking with a customer where they can't leave you, right? <laughs> 18 holes, they can't leave you. Um, so it's, again, it's identifying and changing what the business culture is to include both men and women. That's great. We were, um, in a, I was in a workshop. Actually, this is funny. I delivered a gender equality workshop in a company in, in New York. That's, uh, their headquarters are in the Trump building, so that was kind of fun. So walking in, I was like, oh. Um, the, uh, in that, that conversation, there was... Somebody brought up, oh yeah, strip clubs, because this was, they were talking like, yeah, this is something that, that happens. Like, we go take a client to a strip club. And this was a man saying that. He's like, and, and women will come as part of the company. They'll come because they want to be there with the client. And so that was like, that, to him, that made business sense. And I said, well, let's flip that around. What if she was going to uh, thunder from down under and asked you to go with her? Would you go? And he like got red in the face and had a whole moment where he was like, huh, I've never thought about that before. So <laughs> just like the male culture is so invisible to men that we have a part of our, a part of my work specifically is helping them see it. But um, this is where I think one of those opportunities is like, how are, how are we not, how are we men, talk to me, like sh teach me right now. How are men not seeing the male culture that, you, that we could go back to our companies and say, this is actually something that is not helping us represent women well. well I'm gonna give you the suggestion, we were talking about it in another context, but uh, one of the things that I do in my classroom and any workshops that I do is, the one gift that I wanna give both men and women is doing an exercise I call the devil's advocate exercise. And uh, that's where, the men get, oh, 
this has been, this is the way I've always done things. Um, and most of you are familiar, how many people have been in my session so you know what I'm talking about already? So you're gonna get a little repeat, but um, Devil's Advocate is usually, uh, Leslie presents an idea and Gary, his response is to poke holes in it and say what's wrong with it and why it won't work. And um, by just demonstrating that, I use a video, I um, asked people, okay, if Gary was playing devil's advocate, Leslie, who backs down from her idea and then drops it, um, what, is, what is Leslie playing if, if, if Gary's competency is devil's advocate? And the response is usually, well, Leslie is just, uh, she does, she's not confident. She is playing defense. And uh, I use this as an example. I say, this is an invisible competency. Leslie was trying to build an idea. She was putting it out, she was putting out an idea to be able to get Gary to make suggestions and to make it real, make it possible and workable. And it was a man in one of my workshops who actually said, why don't we call that angel's advocate? And I also use the distinction, the difference between deductive reasoning, which is devil's advocate, and inductive reasoning. And uh, I have people do an exercise where you try on doing both, you know, first doing devil's advocate and then doing the angel's advocate. And that's where the guys get that, yeah, they've been on wheels, on rails, <laughs> excuse me, on rails playing devil's advocate. And, uh, and not even realizing there's a different way of doing things. And it's hard for them to do it the different way. And usually for relational people, it's hard to do the devil's advocate unless you've really been through it so much that you've gotten used to playing it. Um, but, uh, and my favorite example is one of the, um, the local space agency here where the executive in the organization had um, early in the day had said that he was concerned that there were no ideas bubbling up in the organization, that with all the brilliant people that worked there, there were no, there, why were there no new ideas bubbling up? And then when, when it came to the time of playing the devil's advocate exercise, he said to me, you know, we we're about to start the exercise, and he said, Bonita, we do science here. Devil's advocate is science. And I said, okay. You know, I hear you. Are you willing to do the exercise? And when he, he said yes. And when he did the exercise, he was magnanimous enough. And this is, where I'm, this is where the greatness of men shows up, as far as I'm concerned. When I debriefed him, he said, you know, we had so much fun with all the new ideas bubbling up. He used the same expression. We had so much fun that we didn't even play devil's advocate. And they were able to see that they'd created a culture where if you had a new idea, you had to stand up in front of a firing squad. And no one wanted to do that. This, this plays right into the meetings. Um, the problems we come across with male culture in meetings is man interrupting, the mansplaining, and, uh, and at, at risk of doing that. Um, <laughs> I'd love to kind of hear your responses or your experiences with mansplaining or manterrupting in any of your experience at, at work and organizations. Yeah, so uh, I shared with this group that uh, mansplaining I definitely saw all the time. So in fact, at first, because we always think it's something we did, so I would say something and then one of my male counterparts would I think say the exact same thing. And everyone would be like, oh yeah, Joe, that's fantastic. We should do that. And I'd be like, I'm pretty sure I just said that. Didn't I just say that? And I thought to myself, maybe I'm not clear, right? Like there's, some, there's something wrong with my communication. Uh, so I definitely have experienced that uh, many times in my career in many meetings. And so when I was reading about this phenomena, that is very well known from a research perspective. I was like, oh yeah, I totally, I totally have that. And then the next one, I'm reading along in this same research article, and it says, you know, well, women are interrupted, actually not even far more than men. They are actually interrupted and men are not. So men interrupt women, and women will interrupt women, but nobody interrupts men. It's shown through research, all, all kinds of places. 
And I thought, well, that doesn't happen to me because I am, I'm super bold, actually, uh, as might have been noted from the harsh comment earlier. So I, I don't mind like really speaking my mind, right? And I thought, oh yeah, that doesn't happen to me. And so then after reading this article, you know, I'm in meetings all day, every day, and I started to notice that I get interrupted all the time. And so I, I think it was, you know, even in my own self, I didn't notice that it was happening, right? And I think there's a lot that we all can do to help that, right? So there's lots of ways to very politely, right? Like, not rudely, but very politely say, I, you know what, Joe, can you just let me finish because I'm, I wasn't quite done, right? That, it, it's pretty easy to do, and, and it also sort of brings about that, hey, uh, I'm interrupting someone, right? We, uh, when we talk about this in workshops, this comes up, and I, we call it the no Kanye rule. If you install this in your company, it's one of the best little systems you can use. So just let everybody know that we're not having any Kanye's in this meeting, okay? We're going to let everybody have full stage. Is everybody aware of the Kanye? Yeah. Okay, making sure. Um, so the, the interruption thing is... And, the, and mansplaining comes down to voice, right? It comes down to just not even being heard. Like with the idea of meritocracy doesn't exist if, if a whole population isn't even getting a chance to get to the table, right? Yeah, exactly. So we talked about having gender partnership workshops where I, I shared with you that we, we did this in our, com in our company to get awareness. So how many of, you have read Lean In or, ha or are aware of the data, the mansplaining, the manterrupting in this audience? Pretty much everyone, right? How many of you think that the men in your organizations are also aware of those terms? Exactly. So we had a workshop, and this is exactly what we talk about, the manterrupting, the mansplaining. And then we go around the table in very intimate, safe settings. You know, that's key. Can you think of a time lady that you've been man explained to or man interrupted and they share that story then the guys start thinking well shoot I hope I didn't do that or I was there in that meeting and there's this awareness that clicks like that and that's how you change the culture back to the the barrier etc it's opening up that discussion amongst your teams and I was pretty sure that all of you were going to raise your hand and I think Dell was too, had that assumption of knowledge that you guys here at a Women in Tech conference have heard those terms. And think about it, pretty much all of you are from tech companies, and none of you raised your hand that your male colleagues were aware of those terms. So how can they fix that behavior? How can you be an advocate for your lady partner in a meeting if they're not even going to recognize it when you call it out? Like, you know, oh, Amy, exactly. That's such a great thing. You just said that. Can you explain more when someone has stolen her thought or her idea? So it's really getting that awareness out. That's the one thing I think I strongly recommend if we're gonna change our organizations, it has to start with getting that awareness out there to everybody, not just women. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, when I first learned the terms mansplaining and manterrupting, I was really excited about that, and, and I, I thought I'd, I'd use it, you know, to let men know when they were doing it, and I quickly discovered that that was a great way to completely shut down the conversation, well, if not make it hostile, <laughs> and uh, I, got, I got unfriended by a friend on Facebook, and and so I'm curious, would you used those terms in, your, in the workshop and, and the men were open to that? Yeah, abso no. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, hear my voice. Um, yes, they were open to it. So Dale actually led the gender partnership workshop. We actually started with our people leaders. Um, many of them came into the workshop thinking, oh, is this gonna quote be another one of those male over 40 bell bashing sessions? male bashing sessions. Quickly, that turned around. As soon as we started with the business case, the bottom line slides, it was fast into solution mode, and then it was retrospective. Um, it start, we started with our leaders, and then we, we went down throughout the organization, and it's been very, very positive mm -hmm. just this year. Mm -hmm. so and and what happened? Like, oh, I was just going to say, it sounds like the, the workshop really primed them to be, to be open to hearing issues like that. It just gave them, I think, a language mm -hmm. to speak, like a communication space. Mm -hmm. 
and and then when they understood that mansplaining was an unconscious thing that they were doing, that they weren't actively trying to be terrible people, mm -hmm. then they recognized, okay, when someone says I'm mansplaining or man-interrupting, they're not calling me a bad person. They're just saying I did something unconscious. That helps me, actually. Yeah. yeah. And I'll share one more thing. In the leaders workshop that we did back in October, um, Dell had bought, brought two of his colleagues with him. Um, and actually, Telstra US, our country managing director, is a woman. Her name is Amy Rosen. Um, and we were sitting around the table, and one of his male colleagues man interrupted and proceeded to mansplain our country managing director. And she slapped her hand on the table and said, Dude, you just mansplained me. You just, and he turned beet red and such a professional. And, and, an advocate for, for women's rights and, and gender partnership. And it, he said, you're absolutely right. I am so embarrassed, please. And to show that kind of humility in front of an organization, and she was one of three women around the table, really, really was the best thing that could have happened in terms of you know, really being a mentor for the rest of the men in the room. go down just a slightly different path. Um, <clears throat> so I think, you know, we, we talk about, you know, people feel like there's male bashing and um, the male culture, but we all live in the male culture, right? So my example of men interrupt women and women interrupt women, right? This unconscious bias, we all hold it and we pretty much all hold the same thing, right? So if we grew up in the same society, right? Most of us probably did. Um, we grew up that way. And so we're all bound to or driven by that unconscious bias. And I think that it's really important for um, women's organizations. So I started a women in technology group at Walgreens. And I think it's really important for it to be a partnership of both men and women, because we are in it together. It is not a women's problem, right? As, as soon as you make it a women's problem, we've lost the battle, right? And, and I think it really does help men to understand that it, it's not them, it's not you, right? It's the product of how we grew up. And so equally, women, you know, there's all the, there's so much research about everything, but there's all this research about, you know, if you read a resume and has a male's name on top versus a female's name on top, women are just as likely to pick the male as men, right? We live the same situation, right? Yeah. And so we, we have to do things to cover up, uh, to remove the bias. So things like, you know, symphonies have started doing blind auditions. And like 50%, uh, there's been a 50% increase in women on symphonies since that started happening, right? Because you have, you, you can't tell. And at, at one point, they actually had women not wear heels because even if you couldn't see them, you could hear them walk in and you would know that it was a woman, right? So it's just in us. We've been living it for hundreds of years. And Yeah, so I, I think this is a good time to move into what is working. So let's, uh, yeah. So what is, you're, you presented, the, I think, a pr the problem really well. What is working and shifting it? What's working in your organizations? Or I'd like to take just the segue from this to what's working, okay. um, because I know uh, it's like, okay, there's this bias going on, there's the devil's advocate going on, how do we, we manage that? And then take it to the higher level of what's working in the larger organization. Um, I always advocate for anyone to have something prepared that's an authentic expression of yourself for a tough situation. Now, with, with the devil's advocate, I, I suggest that Leslie say to Gary, hold on, Gary, we'll play devil's advocate in a moment. But first, I want your best thinking on this. 
I want to, I want to play angel's advocate. Um, and I may not want to use the word angel's advocate. I may want to say, I want to use inductive reasoning, or I want to build this case. I want to, I want to create this together. Whatever is your authentic language, so that Gary realizes there's a different way of doing something. Gary doesn't know that there's a different way of doing something. So it actually has to be a, te it's a teachable moment, and the, the purpose is to teach, not to make them wrong, but to teach what else is there. And another situation, it might be a, a sexist remark, and then how do you come, how do you, how can you be prepared for that instead of being stunned? Uh, like I say, to have a phrase in your back pocket ready, like to be able to say, George, you know, I really appreciate what you've done for my career. Now I want to do something for yours. And you can count on me to be an ally to let you know when something is inappropriate. What you just said was really can be taken in a very um, hurtful way, or you may not want to use the word hurtful, uh, whatever, however way you want to say it, but be prepared. And I think it's a useful way of saying, you know, I appreciate what you've done for my career. Now I'm going to do something for your career, for you. But for you to find your own phrase that's authentic, that you can feel um, is an expression of how you want to say, have a, have a comeback that's in a those kinds idea. of situations. That's great. Thank you. OK. so. Um, Something I'm really excited about that I, I learned about um, in March at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, something that's working is, well, <laughs> for starters, always asking women, what do they want to need for starters? Um, and the nation of Italy did that. Um, they noticed that women weren't returning to work after having children, and they really felt that their economy was suffering because of that. And they asked them what they wanted, and they you know, decided it was essentially a flexible, flexible working arrangements. And this was in 2014, and at that time, they, they realized that only 8% of employers in Italy offered that. And so the nation, the government, um, started Project Elena, which uh, promoted and incentivized companies to offer flexible working arrangements. Um, and, and, you know, really showed them how, you know, measure performance on results rather than physical presence in the office. And this year, they are up to 30% from 8%. For four years, they have, they have grown to 30% of companies in Italy offer flexible working arrangements, and women are returning to work. It's working. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll add on that. Um, in Telstra, we also have a doctrine of all roles flex, which means that every single position within the organization starts on the premise that it can be done remotely, it can be done flexibly, it can be done in varying hours of the day or the week. Um, and in order to deny somebody that flexibility, the manager actually has to put in a business case as to why it is detrimental to the business to allow that person to work flexibly. So what this has done is it's institutionalized flexible working, not just for mothers, not just for fathers, but for people that actually want to live their life, be in community theater, be involved with their church, et cetera. What this has done, obviously, is brought a diversity of thought to the workplace. It has allowed people to, uh, <clears throat> to be very engaged with the business and most of all, be productive with the business. We are all so much bigger than our jobs and we recognize that. Our last year's employee engagement survey worldwide, 33,000 employees, 87% of them said that they have enough flexibility to live their life and work for Telstra. And that's huge from a retention perspective. Um, and that is one thing that absolutely works. You, did you have, an, I know you had like uh, two or three other things. Did you want to throw those out here as well? Uh, sure. Um, things that work in terms of gender balance or gender partnership. We'll start with the numbers. Setting targets I think is important. It's important because 
we all work for businesses and we all do have to have you know, deliverables. Um, <clears throat> so the start of this year, uh, my US region was targeted with 26% of female representation by the end of our fiscal year, which ends June 30th. We started the year, July 1st, 2016, at 26%. So we thought perhaps there wasn't a lot of thought that went into why they gave us that target. Perhaps we should really do a little bit of analysis and see where we are in terms of our customers and our competitors. And we found that we were way off, surprisingly, in telecommunications. So your Verizons, your AT&Ts, they actually have really good numbers. But we were right there with the tech industry, which is most of our customers and our partners, right? So <clears throat> we had our gender, uh, partnership workshop with the people leaders at the beginning of the year that statistic came out and they said well though no, that's we we can we can solve that we can solve that let's do it let's get to 50% in five years let's do 5% went straight into solution mode without thinking of the how we're gonna do it we're just gonna do it right um, so some of the things that we did do um, <clears throat> is we instituted a 50 50 recruitment policy in the US in July we told all of our recruiters you may not provide any candidates to hiring managers unless they have equal representation with gender. A lot of our more traditional uh, telco recruiters really struggled with that. Um, and I said, well, there's other recruiters that are doing just fine. So they, they quickly adjusted. Um, as a result, happy to report of all of our recruitment year to date, our fiscal year is ending June 30th, of all of our recruitment, 53% were female all of our new hires this year. So that totally worked. And on top of that, sometimes a little, a little organization kind of gives a little bit of fuel to the, the big corporation. So they, Telstra Corporation globally, instituted 50-50 recruitment in March on International Women's Day, actually. So it's really good stuff. Those were the two biggest I would definitely agree with 50-50. Um, we don't do that at Walgreens, but we are working on at least having a female, <laughs> at least having you know, some diversity on the candidate slate, and also diversity on the team that's making the decision. So both of those things, research shows, um, probably for obvious reasons, uh, improve the likelihood of, of getting women in the organization. I think I will also focus on how do you, and then you also talked about how do you keep women, right? How, how do you become an organization that's a great place for women to work? Flexibility is, is obviously definitely one of those. Um, I'll, I'll maybe add a, a different one, which is around the how do we move women up in the organization and how do we get them beyond that manager, senior manager, director level? And what we're doing is really spending a lot of time uh, on our leadership team and in technology on you know, really looking for high potentials and focusing on women. So you know, we used to do succession planning and you know, whatever. Here are the people and here's our hypos and blah, blah, blah. And, and now we really look at, OK, but are we focused enough on women? And what, where do we see women? Well, what about this woman? Why is she not on the list as a hypo? And then, you know, really ensuring we have a conversation around that. And a lot of times after the conversation, we're like, oh, yeah, 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 she should be. You know, she should be in the upper quadrant. Um, and so it's, it's really just that purposefully looking at women. And we, we're doing it during promotions. We're doing it during... Um, the annual review cycle, and then succession planning, all three of those are, we're really focused on women. Um, we've taken a look at making sure that we have women have mentors, right? So how do we pair up women and, and find, it doesn't have to be a woman. This is the other thing that I, I would suggest to everyone. Women don't have to have women mentors. I, I don't think I've ever had a woman mentor. I've never had a woman boss. Um, not that I wouldn't love to, right? Uh, but you know, they just don't exist a lot in my industry, in all of our industries. So um, encourage men to be mentors of women. 
honestly, I have so many men come up to me, oh, I have this great woman on my team, do you think you could mentor her? And I say, uh, I could, but don't you think you could mentor her? And they're like, oh, well, I guess. You know, I mean, like, it just, you just don't think of it, right? They're like, oh, well, she needs a woman to mentor her. I'm like, I don't think so. Uh, I mean, you know, there are things that I might be able to say that not anyone could say, but. So I think even just that, right? Like, every person on our leadership team has selected a woman and is going to be an, at least an advocate and sponsor for and hopefully a mentor to um, a woman on the team. Uh, that's awesome. I, I would also say that um, part of the reason the mentorship thing comes from men in that direction is that the research has shown men are actually a, a bit afraid to ask a younger woman, mm -hmm. because of the optics of that, to be in a mentorship relationship. Mm -hmm. But if it's a formalized mentorship program where they get paired with the female, they are likely to take that relationship and work with it. So there's uh, something to formalizing mentorship that seems to do the trick. Yeah. And I think I have, yeah. So this is the, a slide from the uh, Harvard Business Review did a great piece about which diversity programs work and don't work. And I'll give you the slide of the ones that don't work here in a minute as well. Um, and by the way, if you want a copy of these slides, I'm gonna give you my email address at the end. You can just email me and I'll give them, you, give, give them all to you. I'll give you everything you need. Um, <laughs> The, this is a percent change over five years in representation among managers in a whole slew of, uh, of companies, large US firms. And so you can see there, that the one at the top is voluntary training, and I'm gonna show you a slide about mandatory training, which is gonna look very yellow across the board here in a minute. So any t anytime you're doing a diversity training, you wanna make sure that it is voluntary. Um, what's great is if you ha ask, if you have a women, how many of you have like a women's involving women, like ERG in your company already? So one of the best ways to get men to volunteer to show up to trainings is what we call a mandatory mandate. And you just ask a man who is on your team to come with you to the next gender diversity or women's meeting. They will come because they were invited and they respect you. Largely, men tend to respect the women they work with but not understand that they don't respect the women that they don't work with. It's like a strange sort of cognitive dissonance thing. So when a woman invites me to show up to a meeting about d gender diversity, I'll show up. So voluntary training moves uh, the needle across the board. Self-managed teams, just, I'm gonna just give you these real quick. Self-managed teams are, are basically broad-based leadership teams. Um, cross-training is like functional cross-training. Think CEO spending a day in the mailroom concept. And that's largely the, the reason that works is because people are bumping elbows with different kinds of people suddenly. Um, college recruitment for women and minorities both work in a big way, and that, those are self-explanatory. Mentoring, um, and this is where we get into, if you set up a formalized mentorship program, the reason why it works is because white males will accidentally just go get mentors. Um, it's sort of, like you said, it's built into the water that we swim in. Um, and, and the older, which are 85% of CEOs right now, older white men, don't actively seek out mentors who don't look like them. So we set up those, that makes a difference. And obviously then having a diversity task force and manager is self-explanatory. Um, I'll give you the negatives of this real quick. Mandatory diversity training actually creates more problems than it solves. Um, job tests also for the same reason that the heels was creating problems. People were finding the gender, um, the, they were finding the gender sort of icons within it and uh, grievance systems, so this is uh, something you can get a little deeper into, but basically the idea is we want to do a better job with diversity program that allows voluntary training, that allows people to step in as engaged allies, this is men and women. Um, and I would, if you haven't read this, this is something that I would just highly suggest. Amy actually uh, turned me on to this to give due credit, so. Um, let's move. I'm cognizant we're running out of time, I want to do Q&A. So uh, we've talked about that a bit. Let's talk about the UN for a moment. Does that sound good? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite uh, subject. So the UN sustainability goals, um, number five in there is gender equality, but the gender equality is sort of across the board, isn't it, Amy? Mm. Uh, I'm sorry, she was talking to me. Uh, what did gen you say? Gender equality is number five on here, but it sort of is relevant across the board, right? Like this is something that we've seen. If you create gender equality in the world and the workplace, it would affect really all of these issues. 
Yeah, well, I think it's um, what's important about this, these these were established by the, the UN in 2015, and uh, it's the first time that gender, achieving gender equality has been made, uh, has been put on the global agenda. Um, so that's super exciting. And um, additionally, the UN has been really clear that almost every other um, of the, the other 16 goals cannot be achieved without gender equality. So everyone, men, women, boys, girls, everyone needs to be mobilized um, in order to, to reach these goals. So um, that's extremely encouraging to me that it's not just UN women talking about gender equality as a women's issue or a human rights issue. It's actually the whole United Nations, the largest international body, telling us that gender equality um, and women's empowerment is a cornerstone of progress for every society in the world. And That's huge. And companies can actually sign on to the UN Women's Sustainability. Or UN, tell me, how, how can companies sign up? What, I'm sorry, what is your question? There's somebody, there, I know that there's a way that a company can actually sign on yeah. to the goals. Okay, it's not exactly signing on to the goals, but um, it's um, there are women's empowerment principles that UN Women has created, uh, and these are guidelines, recommendations for companies. Um, if, if, you know, they take the best practices that they know of, and they're making suggestions. So um, for the private sector, they, you know, governments have recommendations and civil society and the private sector too. So your company can become a signer onto the women's empowerment principles if you like. And uh, I very much encourage that. It's a good start. Well, I just wanted to add, I, you know, to me it's very exciting that UN women have declared Planet 5050 the, as, as the expression of that if we don't, they, uh, let me put it positively. When we have 50-50 representation of men and women at every decision-making table, that will, will allow the accomplishment of these extraordinary goals. So I like, I like to invite everyone to look at, you are all working on these goals. You are all contributing to these goals as you are here committed to, um, to gender partnership. And I actually have a cool uh, representation of that. This is from McKinsey's report about what would happen if we reach 50-50 partnership across the, the globe. And their um, projection is that in, within 10 years, we would reach $28 trillion of additional annual GDP if the full potential of bridging the, the gender gap was achieved. I just kind of want to put that into perspective for a moment. If we had an extra $28 trillion, the estimates of what it would take to solve global poverty, clean water for everyone in the world, college for everyone that's in the United States, US student loan forgiveness, solve world hunger, and send humans to Mars and back, with $28 trillion, we could solve all those problems and have $22.6 trillion left over. So that would be annualized, by the way. So we would, after that, we would basically have the world solved and $28 trillion to play with. So let's do this and save the world. And it's the thinking that comes with it, <laughs> So, and it, and it goes beyond just the cash, is what Bonita just said, right? It's that, it's that when you empower women, women tend to make more relational decisions, um, and which, which then leads us into these kinds of things. So, uh, When I present to workshops, to conferences, to companies, I tend to talk about this, and I will talk about this tomorrow if you come to my thing, uh, my keynote. Um, this is surprising to a lot of people because they go, oh, okay, I get it. Let's make this a priority and then we'll just fix it. Um, so just wanted to share that. So I want to close with uh, what can we do here? This is, uh, I know, the main question. What can I do when I go back to my company? What can I do when I'm out in the world? What can I do in my partnership at home? What, it, what can I do? So I'd like to take a minute or so and just kind of go through what are the, the, the one thing you would take away as the most important thing we can do? Just one thing. <laughs> I know, I know. We're, that's, we're that's at really the five tough. minute mark. So. Okay, I'll, I'll just I'll keep it quick. Um, all right, it's going to be like one and a half. Um, so don't be afraid to step up and be the first one in your company to come forward and be the leader, um, and use the business case to to get the attention of of the the C suite and the budget that you're going to need for the initiatives. Um, and uh, you know, find out what uh, what women and, and other um, 
uh, minorities, if you include them in your program, um, I recommend that. <laughs> uh, you know, find out what they need and, and go from there. Um, I would say learn. So learn a lot about what is behind this gender bias and, and what you yourself are doing to proliferate the gender bias. And then share your learnings, right? Share with people. I think it starts with an understanding. And so you can bring that to even one other person. You could bring it to your whole team. You can bring it to your division, right? At, but um, learning for yourself and then changing your habits is, is a good place to start. I think it's, again, in engaging in conversations with your teams about awareness, awen awareness of what existing issues there are not having gender partnership and how you can work towards gender partnership. One thing really quickly that came out of one of our workshops was that um, we had this discussion, this was the people leader workshop, and one of the men said, well, you say all this, but you know, when my wife was trying to go back to work after being on maternity leave, you didn't offer me any type of benefits to assist with that. So when I had to help her out and help her go back into the workforce, I wasn't able to do so because I had no bond with my newborn and my wife had to go back to work, so it's not hard. And that was eye-opening for me as head of HR that I did not know that there was underlying bias in our policies with respect to family care um, and we've since changed that, and that came out, again, as a direct result of having that conversation and opening it up. That's paternity leave, to, right. And for me, again, it's teach. Teach what, what you are bringing that's different, and step forward with that, find a way to express it in your own voice. Um, many of you have the chart that I developed, and if you don't come up afterwards, and I'll give you the chart that gives you some guidelines for being able to articulate your fire prevention uh, competencies, your ability to get into the customer's shoes and look from there, your ability to connect the dots and come up with solutions that are much more complex, but that you can, you can convey uh, in simple terms, and teach the, that to others. So we have uh, about three minutes. I'd love to open up for a question or so. <laughs> uh, I think there's a mic right there behind you. Or you can have mine, either way. I don't know how to turn them Go on. Go ahead. Go ahead and just okay. talk. So this is to into you, the mic. The mic's on. Oh, it is. Yeah, just <laughs> okay. talk into the mic. So this is to you, Dale. So you mentioned um, you have sisters, and you were raised to empower women. I think that you, each one of you have touched on this. If we don't raise our children to see women as equals, if we don't raise our boys to see women as equal, nothing will ever change. You mentioned being a strong, tomboyish girl. I was raised the same. My parents only wanted boys. There were seven girls. <laughs> I didn't know the difference when I was growing up. And I've noticed that there are a lot of people who weren't raised that way. And it's... Uh, I, I want to say I wanted to hug you like the first second you started talking. It's amazing to see a man that is so open, and not everyone is. And I think that for us, yes, we can go back to our work, and we could talk to our coworkers, and we can try and change a 50, 60, 70-year-old man's perspective. 90% of the time, it probably won't happen. But if we start with our youth, our own children, I think it will. Um, what I would add on to that, and I Thank have you. two minutes and four seconds, so I can say something. Right? Say something. So um, I started, you know, I talked very early on here about working with young girls um, and then actually through high school. I, I've started participating in two organizations, Girls Who Code and Girls on the Run. And it came from my son, who does very well in school, had all friends that were boys, which was really not that surprising, except one day, out of the blue, I asked him, so are, like, what about the girls that are in all of your AP physics and calculus and, you know, science and math classes? He's like, Mom, there aren't any girls in my classes. Now, I live in an affluent area, right? Like, and, and I'm pretty sure there are girls that live near me that are smart enough to be in AP calculus. And I said, really? He goes, I haven't had a girl in one of my science or math classes 
since freshman year. And I was shocked, flabbergasted. I called the principal. How, how, can, like, how can this be? And what I came to see, right, is, right, I live in an affluent community. A lot of the moms stay home, right? And so what do people see? All these kids, boys and girls, what they see is that the moms stay home. And so one of the things that I think we can do beyond teaching our own children, because there is the other part that they're not teaching their children, right, um, is be that role model. I go to their high school frequently. I go into the classes. I go in, like, I talk there. I'm in their women in STEM group. I, I talk with their computer science. Um, and now I've started to move down even into the elementary school because I've started to see statistics about girls stop raising their hands in fifth grade, right? I mean, it's crazy. And so, but we can be the role model. And then they go, oh, hey, actually, look at this woman. She's an executive at Walgreens. She runs the technology for every pharmacy in Walgreens. Like, wow, I could maybe be that. You're kind right? of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. <laughs> Everybody go see Wonder Woman, too. Um, the other thing I would say is if you have questions that we didn't get to today, obviously, um, please email whoever you'd like to have questions answered from. And uh, again, if you'd like the slides, and I have deeper research and slides to send you, dale at dalethomasbond.com. Thank you. I feel so honored to have been here with you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We're done. Thank you, Dale.